Hello and welcome to Fully Charged. Now, there's, I want to say a couple of things before I start. If I mention Teslas in any kind of positive way on Fully Charged, I will guarantee, be guaranteed to get a comment that says, I'm a Tesla fanboy and it's so tragic and they're only for rich people. If I criticise Tesla or don't mention Tesla in some way when I'm talking about electric cars, I get told I'm a Tesla hater. Why do I pander to all the Tesla haters? So what I'm going to tell you right now, if you're one of those people that might make that comment, is make the comments. It's fine. It's fine. I don't mind. I might not read them uh, because this episode is going to be Tesla-tastic. It's Tesla-obsessed. This is a Tesla tsunami. Now, I'm guessing there's going to be a very few people who watch Fully Charged who aren't aware that Tesla have recently launched a new model, the Tesla Model Y. It's in production. Lots of people have got them in America already, and they all seem to love them. Now, we are not going to get a Tesla Model Y on the roads of Europe until roughly 2022, although I know, I know that the Norwegians will get them first because Norway always gets everything first and it's not fair and it's really not fair that you get everything Norway. I'm, I'm sulking. I'm actually sulking. Anyway, I digress, but I thought it was worth having a quick look at what we can expect from the Tesla Model Y. Now, the Tesla Model Y uses 75% of exactly the same components as the Tesla Model 3. There's the big advantage, because if there's one criticism I would have for the Tesla Model 3, it is the what we call the boot, the trunk, the lid that lifts up, uh -uh, and it's all a bit dark and low and a bit awkward to get stuff in if you've got big things. It's quite a big boot trunk. Uh, that's not the problem so much. It's more the entrance to it is a bit awkward, and it looks like it should just lift the whole back window up and everything, like a like a hatchback or a tailgate car or an SUV. I don't even know what you call it. Well, the Model Y does that. It's got a great big back door. It's got a huge back door and massive rear end capacity. Now, other than that, the increased size. I'll get to that in a moment. The interior looks identical to the Model 3. I cannot see any difference. It's exactly the same layout, exactly the same components are being used. So that is all very familiar. But what isn't familiar is the size. Now, one of the reasons I truly love the Tesla Model 3 is because it's much smaller than the Tesla Model S, which was the one I had before that, uh, which is just too big for our roads in Europe. And, uh, you know, it's just too big. Uh, for me, anyway. I never had a car that big in my life. It was uh, enormous. So the Tesla Model 3 is far, it's narrower, it's shorter, it's easier to park, it's got a tighter turning circle, it's just better. I just think the Model 3 is brilliant. But the Model Y has got a bit pumped up. It's a bit beefier. It is 5.5 centimetres or 2.2 inches longer. It is 7.7 .7 centimetres or 2.8 inches wider and it's 18.2 centimeters or 7.2 inches taller which is fine i'm not worried about the taller that's probably quite a good thing but the wider when i read that i went oh what a shame because whatever the width of the the, the, the model 3 is it's it's so much easier to go down little narrow lanes or narrow streets or park in narrow streets in the uk and it's just a big wide car it's just like why it's got it's so american i suppose it's an american car what do we expect which is fine if you want something bigger. And clearly the rear seats are a lot roomier. There's more headroom, all those things. But I must admit, I've sat in the back of the Model 3. I really found it. it it's more comfortable than the Model S I had. 
much more with more room even though it's a smaller car so it's a better designed car but obviously yes the model y is better and it's bigger and it's wider and then like many other tesla models it comes in various configurations the starting one the base model is the the standard range rear wheel drive and that has a price currently of $39,000, so just under $40,000, uh, which is translates to €36,000 or £32,000 at the moment. Please take these prices in the broadest possible spectrum. It's going to be, for, the, for British people, it's going to be between thirty pounds and £40,000. It's in that neighbourhood <laughs> because the well, because currency is fluctuating, the world's gone insane, and new cars are expensive. Now, the standard range has an EPA range of 370 kilometers or 229 miles. That's the EPA estimate. The WLTP estimate is 389 uh, kilometers or 242 miles. So you just check, pick which one you prefer. Then there is the long range rear wheel drive model. Uh, that comes that costs around $48,000, which is 44,500 euros or 40,000 pounds ish. Or thereabouts now this version has an EPA range of 484 kilometers or 301 miles not 300 301 very important of course the WLTP range completely different that's 540 kilometers or 335 miles again whoever you wish to believe in just go for it because it's random I would say that the the long range rear wheel drive is going to hover around the 300 mile mark then there's the long range all wheel drive model, which comes in at $52,000 or 48,100 euros or 43,000 pounds. So that has slightly longer range than the others around, they're all around 300 and 315 miles, the, the range, or, you know, 500 kilometers, something in that region. They're clearly all that. Finally, the Tesla Model Y performance all wheel drive that's your top of the range jobby uh, that one will set you back $61,000 or 56,000 euros or 50,000 quid uh, and th that has an EPA range of uh, 500 kilometers or 315 miles so yeah around that range it's going to be uh, WLTP this is peculiar I've been looking this up WLTP gives this a shorter range of 480 kilometers or 298 miles where in all the others the WLTP range was longer was further in this particular instance of the Model Y performance all-wheel drive uh, it's lower who knows anyway if you're coming out of a school and it's a busy road and there's children running about you can do 0 to 60 in this car in 3.5 seconds which is incredibly useful I'm being a bit cynical there because obviously normal people wouldn't try and do that but it does accelerate extremely fast a sub 4 second 0 to 60 is always a little bit gut-wrenching and hurts your neck So that's all fine and dandy and we're not going to get it for another couple of years or 18 months at least but as i'm sure some of you will say it's just another big suv and well i agree but i'm going to point out some really important caveats what tesla in particular and many other manufacturers got to give them their due are developing very rapidly is incredible developments in technology the the changes and the developments and the improvements in electric cars are extraordinary and incredibly rapid and what tesla are doing is jumping ahead all the time they're always way way ahead of all the other manufacturers with their technology with their battery technology in particular which i'll get to in a minute but also their their software the, the fact that the car updates my car's constantly updating it's constantly improving even now you just park it, it says there's an update it'll go on at midnight ping it get update in the morning it's a different car lots of people have talked about it if you want to know more about it we've done previous episodes about it but at the moment they still are more expensive but the whole point of this technological development is that it's making the components and the batteries and the, and the software and everything cheaper we are looking at a future with cheaper electric cars I mean, they're already cheaper to run. Everyone knows that who's driven one, who's had one for any length of time. They're much cheaper to operate than, uh, than combustion engine cars. But here's the really critical thing. Combustion engine cars 
are now, and I will argue as to why, are a static technology. Over the last 60 or 70 years, the improvements, the refinement, the, uh, the reliability, the fuel economy, the, the, the long life of um, internal combustion engines has improved and improved and improved. If you go back to when I was born, internal combustion engines were massively inefficient, hopelessly uh, unreliable. They were constantly breaking down. They were a right pain and toxic beyond all measure. And they have got much, much better. There's no denying it. They're so much better now. They last hundreds of thousands of miles. They're really, really good. They need a lot of servicing and a lot of spare parts, but they are generally hugely improved. But they have reached a point where any improvement now is, is points of a percentage improvement. It's a tiny, tiny improvement. What's happening with electric cars is cataclysmic increases in efficiency, in less energy use, in more energy density in the batteries, in lighter batteries, in longer range, in more reliability, in longer life. This is what's really critical. I did mention in a recent episode about Lexus giving the uh, giving their Lexus uh, UX 300e uh, a, a million kilometer warranty on the batteries. A company, as I said then, a company is not going to do that if the technology isn't reliable. Tesla are about to announce in a new uh, exciting announcement they're going to be making very soon a million mile battery, a battery that will last one million miles. That's how many times you can recharge it before it has anything like any reduction in capacity. We now know that electric car batteries last longer and can be recycled. And all the, I think, totally legitimate concerns that people expressed about uh, this new technology, about the batteries and whether we, have to, whether we can just have to throw them away after a year and a half, all those have really been addressed and, are, and con they are continuing to be addressed. And they are continuing to improve and they are continuing to last longer than anyone expected. So as I said, Tesla are very shortly announcing uh, some new battery technology that they're going to be introducing into their cars uh, by the end of this year. They have the four, I think, critical elements of what batteries need to have in order to uh, facilitate mass adoption. But they've got to be lighter, they've got to be more energy dense, they've got to be cheaper. And that's three, but here's the most important one, I think. They have got to use materials that are very common and are easy to recycle. That is critically important. And in particular, the batteries that they're developing now use either zero or minuscule amounts of cobalt. And that has always been a contentious element in battery production. And as I said, batteries that at the end of their life, and I'm talking 30 to 35 years of their useful life, at the end of that, then they can be recycled. So this underlying technology that's being developed, I think is more important than what seat color it has or the zero to 60 time or the design of the wheels. I mean, those are great. The aesthetics are very important, but what's happening underneath the floor of the car, if you like, is what I think is really important. And the other thing that's happening is as the manufacturing capacity increases around the world, at exponential rate, the just sheer economies of scale means the costs are coming down. Now I've repeated this endlessly, but I think it's really worth reminding ourselves of this fact. 2010, when I first started making fully charged, a battery pack cost $1,500 per kilowatt hour to manufacture. What's happened now in 2020, uh, battery costs are around $140, $140 per kilowatt hour. And what Tesla are about to introduce, and everyone's speculating madly about this, is will they break the $100 per kilowatt hour barrier, which it looks like they're going to. Not just Tesla, other manufacturers as well, other battery makers as well around the world. Once they get to the $100 per kilowatt hour, it is, without any argument, going to be cheaper to make an electric car than it is to make a petrol one. And when that happens, people were projecting 23, 2023, 2024. It now looks like it's going to be next, next year, 2021, when this happens. That changes the picture dramatically. So it will no longer be, oh, I'd love an electric car, but I can't afford one. It will be people saying, oh, I love those old petrol cars. They're brilliant, but I really can't afford one. I'll just stick with my electric one. So as I said, new factories are being built all over the world. And this is kind of interesting for us, some news that's just come out, because when we first announced that we were going to do Fully Charged Live at North America in Austin, Texas, people said, why Austin, Texas? Why not California, where there's thousands of electric cars? Well, it felt right, and we weren't wrong. So we're now feeling a little bit smug, a little bit holier than thou, because it's just been announced that Tesla are going to build another new factory in Austin, Texas. And this isn't a gigafactory. No, that's too small. This is much bigger than a gigafactory. This is 
A terror factory. <laughs> a terror factory? What the hell is that? Just a big factory. I mean, it has to have a cool name. It's a big factory in Austin, Texas. So by the time of the next Fully Charged Live in uh, in Austin, Texas in 2021, in an amazing new location, we're about to announce the, the, all the, the dates and the times and everything uh, very soon. But by the time that happens, there will be a Tesla Terra factory just up the road. Anyway, that's all. I mean, that was a Tesla-tastic episode. I know there are, I know other manufacturers are available and uh, we normally cover them, but I thought that was quite... There's some really big te uh, Tesla news coming out and I hope you've noticed that I didn't mention a certain person's name because yes, yes, he's the big figurehead and all that stuff with Tesla and he's everywhere. But actually, I always think it's the engineers and the scientists and the people who build the cars. That's who I'm really more interested in. And they don't tend to tweet something really bizarre and they call their children... John. Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, before I go, I just want to say thank you to some brilliant Patreon supporters who support this show uh, with $10 a month or more. Incredible. So generous of you. Uh, the, the support has continued through the recent months, which has been incredibly heartwarming. The whole team are really grateful for, for your support because that's what keeps us going. So I just want to thank the following people for their support. James Taylor, Harold Plurg, Robert Abel, Gilherm Carvalho, Richard Atkin, Peter Ford, Des Gwinnell, Andy Rimmel, Scott Pritchett, David Nichols, Mark Quayle, David Jebson, Quogo, Robert Hill, James Skerritt, Paul Sasso, Moritz Wolf Metternich, Dan Tamone, Hilton Mode, and Matthew Canty. Thank you all so much for your support. So please do have a look at the Patreon page if you want to. The links are all beneath this video in the description. Uh, there's also the YouTube membership, which is very exciting. Uh, we're trying to think of more things that we're going to do with that. Um, please do, obviously, subscribe to Fully Charged. really nice if you did. Uh, you can click the little bell thing and then you never know, a little show will pop up on your reminders and you can see it because we're putting a lot of shows out at the moment. And, as always... If you have been, thank you for watching.